guys, welcome back. So today's video, I picked out nine plants that have really stood the test of time with me. They're nine plants that maybe on the surface look like they're quite fussy, but actually have been real troopers, very resilient, very accepting of different conditions and varying degrees of neglect. So basically they're plants that don't cause me any stress, whether it be that they're just like easy going species or hybrids or cultivars, or that I've been able to kind of crack the code on what makes them grow happy and healthy. I really did have a hard time putting together this list because there were just plants that either haven't been with me long enough for me to like really be able to stand behind it or there's been an incident or something where they've really thrown a fit. I had to really pare down my list quite a bit, but I have plants from four different genera to show you. I have philodendrons, anthuriums, a couple of alocasia, and a monstera. I think I'll go through them by genus. So before I show you the plants, I just want to give a quick background on how I'm growing these plants, just so there's just like a general understanding of the conditions that they're growing in. So the majority of them are grown in greenhouses. Not all of them are, but um, when I say exo, I mean my exoterra terrariums, which actually aren't rigged to be very high humidity, like terrarium environments. I don't have hygrometers in there currently, but I estimate the exos to be around 60% humidity. And when I say tent, I mean like pretty optimal tropical conditions. So quite warm during the day, like mid 20s Celsius. Um, in the summer, it can creep up to like low 30s. And at night, it'll probably drop down to like 21, 22 degrees. So about 25 on average and quite high humidity of say probably 80 to 90 percent no fans and when i say just like out in the open living room conditions i mean about 30 percent humidity pretty cold i would say my house is on the cooler side so around like 21 degrees during the day maybe like 20 at night 19 20 at night and my house is quite dark so basically everywhere i grow plants i rely pretty heavily on grow lights so the grow light that i use the most heavily throughout the house is the 10 watt Verena t5 yellow grow lights and just recently i've started using the mother grow light and i've also in the past used um monios t5s but none of the plants i'm showing you today have been growing under those lights so i would just say Across the board, the barinas are the ones I've been growing these plants. I feed my plants with every single watering, a diluted amount. I feed all throughout the year, um, through the winter, doesn't matter what time of the year. I'm always feeding my plants because they're always growing. And currently for the, I would say the past five months-ish, I think four months, I've been feeding a mixture of TPS1 and CalMag. And uh, previously I've also used um, MSU, uh, liquid gold leaf, that what Dynagrow liquid no Dyna liquid Dyna Dynagrow Foliage Pro so MSU liquid gold leaf Dynagrow Foliage Pro and I think that's about it and lastly I tend to be an underwaterer so for a plant to be fairly easy going for me has to be able to be pretty forgiving of like some drought every now and then at least. So I'll be going through each plant in more detail just to tell you any specifics about that plant, how, um, you know, what, what I've done to kind of mature them, what's working for me and why it's been so easy for me. So the majority of these plants, I would say all but one or two of these plants have been with me for over a year. So I've been able to grow them out from a juvenile state or rehab them from import. They've gone through enough of a journey with me that I can kind of say for certain that they are like good plants to own. If you've been holding off on any of these plants because maybe they have a reputation for being finicky or high maintenance, I am here to give you maybe a different perspective. Maybe we'll start with Anthurium because um, actually I'm really excited to show you one of these plants. So I'm kicking it off with like my favorite leaf in my entire collection right now. This is my Anthurium King of Spades and I've been posting this so much in my Instagram story lately because I just I can't get over how beautiful this leaf is turning out to be and also how big it's getting like compared to the last leaf here this one is quite a lot bigger and it's still super super floppy it was still really really small when I filmed my plant tour it was like maybe this small so I was like oh it's gonna be a good one but I really had no <laughs> idea it was gonna be this good so I imported this plant I think around the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021 around then um so it's been almost two years i've had this plant it's gone through a couple of chops it's 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 produced little offset that i've um traded with a friend i've chopped it and given it a cutting and i will say that this plant really really roots easily it's not like the fastest grower it's not like 
I don't know, I would say probably my fastest growing anthuriums are like the Politiflorum or the Dark Phoenix. This one's not that fast. I would say I get a new leaf every like three months or so, but it's so forgiving of low humidity. It's so forgiving of underwatering. Like I frequently underwater this plant because it's in <laughs> a really, really tiny pot. It really is just such an easy going anthurium. Probably because there's like a million species mixed into it. Nobody really knows what's um, in the lineage of uh, the King of Spades, but it definitely has that hybrid vigor. I've done some comparisons between my King of Spades and Charmaine's King of Spades, and we're anecdotally observing that higher light gives more purples and reds in the emergent leaves. I had much more vibrant red leaves when I was using a stronger, like a 20 watt light above it. And now that I have dropped them to slightly weaker lights, um, the, the plant seems to kind of get this like brownie color a little bit earlier. I'll see if I can find a photo of Charmaine's King of Space that was getting way more light than mine. And it hardened to this like really dark, like purple, bruisey purple and that purple stay for quite a long time. We'll see how the color remains on this one, but I'm quite certain that ours are clones of each other. They were purchased as cuttings from the same supplier in Indonesia, so I think that they were propagated by a cutting. So I just want to give you a close-up of this leaf because it's just, just everything. I don't know how big it's going to end up being, but like if it just hardened off at this size, I'd be really happy, but given the softness right now, it still has quite a ways to go. Also, you can see in this pot that it's like super, super full of roots. This happened very, very quickly. I think I chopped and um, potted this plant coming up to a year ago. It's not quite been a year yet, but it like, it really, really filled out this pot super quickly. I'm really happy that people are appreciating just how adorable this plant is. It's so round and it's so variable. He can have like really, really different shapes. Some of them are more elongated. Some of them are really like chubby and round. Some of them are very heart shaped and the colors and then the amount of silver that bleeds out from the veins. Like you can have these like random like silvery patches of what looks like variegation, but it's like silver splotches around the leaves. So if you are interested in, in this plant and you can find one for a pretty good price, I would highly, highly recommend it. I have read in a Facebook discussion. I don't remember who it was. They were talking about the different generations of King of Spades. They were saying that the F1 generation is a lot prettier, a lot more red, a lot more that classic King of Spades look. And the F2 King of Spades are a little bit more green, a little less um, vibrant. So I feel like if you're going to get one, I would try to ask for pictures of the mother plant and find out if it was like propagated by a seed or by cutting. I also know that um, Cartel Don in Indonesia is selling like really, really nice ones that he got, I believe straight from Haji Uli, which is the original hybridizer. I don't know what generation mine would have been. I did get it fairly early on, like before they were being called King of Spades, but that doesn't really mean much. But that said, I really, really like how this one looks. So whatever generation it is, I don't really care because it's just so cute. So that one's currently my most favorite leaf in my entire collection. Next up is my Anthurium Politiflorum. So I want to say I've had this for almost two years now. It would have been winter of 2021 that I got this uh, from Equiflora. It was an import. It was a single leaf, I think, or two leaf. It was, um, I think the import leaves have died, but this was one of the easiest anthuriums to acclimate. It rooted like within like the first week. I had it in moss in like a bin and I wanted this plant so bad. So I was terrified. I was so scared that I was going to lose it. I had also a pendens in that import or maybe a, also a pendens before that and it, it did not do well. One of them died. So I was like, oh my God, this politiflorum, it's going to die. It's my like number one wishlist anthurium at the time and I'm not, it's not gonna make it and I'm gonna be so sad but it's been so so easy it's been just a really steady grower so once it's got rooted and started growing it's been just kind of like one leaf after the other it never really pauses and never really goes through any dormancy with me the only thing I would say about it is that it is incredibly thirsty which you know kind of makes sense given like its growth rate currently I have it in uh, tree fern fiber. I used to have it in a slitted pot with moss and it, 
there was some bark kind of mixed into the moss and it seemed to really really like that but I didn't really like that because that kind of pot plus that kind of substrate meant it was really really hard to get that like root ball really really watered so I moved it to no drainage without slits tree fern fiber with a kind of reservoir layer at the bottom just so I could not have to water this plant like every three days I feel like it kind of preferred that slitted pot setup but I couldn't keep up with it so if I had kept it in that pot with that moss I probably would have ended up killing it from underwatering so this pot is definitely for my own sanity. It's not like root bound or anything, but it's, it has rooted quite a bit in the substrate and it's given me um, one or two leaves, I think. It's given me this leaf since the repot and also this leaf here. And each leaf just keeps getting bigger and bigger and it is currently in flower. This little cute thing here, I love how it just like kind of turns up like that and it's got this like kind of minty color to it it finally opened up for me but it's not yet receptive there's you can see there's no like stigmatic fluid on it or anything so i don't know what to do with it yet i'm keeping an eye on all my inflows just to see who's gonna match up with who but so far nobody's receptive right now i have forgetty eye in flower i have a crystallinum in flower no i have two forgetty eyes in flower and also this one so i have four plants We'll just see how they match up. I forgot to mention, I have the King of Spades and this Politiform currently growing in the same exo, this one right here. So again, not the highest humidity, probably like around 60%. For that reason, I feel like both of them would do fine in regular room conditions. I could probably grow it out here, but then I kind of enjoy seeing them in this exo. I kind of like my exos to be kind of like a display case. I mean, that's exactly what they are, they're a display case. I feel like because this is like a velvety strap leaf anthurium, it's easy to kind of assume that this one's going to be a finicky one or like require quite high humidity, but I can tell you for a fact that they really don't. I know a lot of people grow them in their living rooms. I think that if I grew them in my tent, it would probably be bigger by now, but it also takes up so much space and I don't really need it to be massive. I would like the straps to get longer, but besides that, like I'm quite happy with the rate that it's sizing up. So I've talked about Amanda a lot. She's our friend. Um, bunny on instagram she is quite notorious for growing all her plants in regular room conditions i would say like the majority of her plants minus maybe her like tiny tiny seedlings and she grows them absolutely massive like i don't know how she does it but they look her plants look like they could be in a conservatory and this is one of the plants that she has growing in her living room which is like she has less leaves than me but the leaves that she has are gigantic they're huge they're fat, they're beautiful. The good thing is that this plant is so much more available. So they weren't super expensive when I imported them. I think they were around $40 US, but it was really hard to get one. They were very scarce. And the specimens that were coming in were like obviously very recently chopped because they're trying to sell as many as possible. So if you like the velvety types, but you're not really into strap leaves, I feel like this could be the gateway strap leaf anthurium because it's so easy going and it's just, such a good good strap leaf plant it was probably my number one wish list plant in 2020 for a good amount of the year at least like it was maybe in the top three for a really long time until i got it so so i don't think i would ever get rid of this in my collection it's just such a rewarding plant to keep it's like your buddy you know it feels like it's very understanding and yeah i i love it so much okay next anthurium it's kind of cheating because i haven't had it that long this is my anthurium crystallinum luxurians cross from amanda i've had it for about three months about roughly three months so it hasn't really been that long but i just know that this plant is easy going i moved it to pond when i got it and for some reason i thought i was just gonna grow this in my my like open shelving here i could have put it in my tent but I gave this one a shot and it rooted pretty easily in this pond um, without a lot of warmth, without a lot of humidity. And I just recently put out this leaf. I'm so happy about it. This was the leaf that was on it when I first got it and it's been working on this leaf for quite some time and it's still expanding a little bit, but I think it's almost done. But yeah, I've only had this three months, but I also have a Crystal Mag Lux, um, two of them actually from Lauren and I, and I find those ones quite easy going as well, but also seedlings tend to grow quite quickly anyways, like 
when they're quite young so I feel like this one is at a stage where it's really gonna you know show its cards <laughs> I just think that at this stage is when the plant starts to slow down and really starts to you know stop growing if it's not given the condition it likes and I have it in this EXO as well so the same EXO as the Politiflorum and the King of Spades it's in pond it gets watered when it's completely dry it hasn't lost any leaves since I got it from Amanda and I think before it was in tree fern fiber with some pond mixed in so now it's in full pond it took to the transition super well I just have a really good feeling that this plant is going to be really really good and I think um, because there are so many Lux hybrids out there and a lot of them look like pretty much the same it's, good, it's really hard to tell them apart so I think if you're able to get your hands on one like a Crystal Lux or Mag Lux or Crystal Mag Lux I think any of those would be quite easy going maybe Forgetty Eye Lux would be really cool I've been looking for one but I, I'm looking for one that's already Peltate what else? I don't know about Regale Lux or Lux Regale because Regale is such a bitch but any of the ones I just mentioned I think would be a safe bet. These plants have that hybrid vigor and the substrates I feel like I would be comfortable growing them in is definitely pond or tree fern fiber with like perlite or pond mixed in or um, or soil. Those would be my go-to substrates for these. So yeah I don't have a ton to say about the, my journey with this one because it's only been a few months but it's uh it's a definitely a good one all right so this next one excuse the droop it's a little bit droopy right now this is my alocasia fry deck this is the fewest leaves i've had on it in a really long time so just just hear me out i've had this plant coming up to a year i think it'll be a year in like a few weeks where i had it as like a spread a little baby corm I'll throw up a photo of uh, what it looked like kind of around when I first got it so it was grown from a corm and it's been such a steady and constant grower for me I had a little hiccup with this plant when um, I moved it out of an exo a very high humidity exo at the time that exo was um, rigged to be quite high humidity because I had a leka drainage layer at the bottom with a bunch of moss on top that I tried to like kind of fill with water all the time and I would say it's probably like 80 to 90% humidity at the time. So I've ripped it out. I dismantled that exo when I was kind of redoing this side of the room. And I just put it on a shelf, just out in the open. And it started to brown at the very, very white bit. So it's been kind of coming back since then. When it came back, the leaves um, were kind of set back a little bit in size. So these are this leaf and certainly this leaf is smaller than like previous leaves this was one of the previous ones you could see i think this was must have been grown right before the uh the rehoming so yeah it's a little bit droopy right now because i had repotted it recently and i got rid of a lot of the roots that i was a little bit sus about in order to fish out the baby the little corm that was like probably this far down the pot it was like pressed up against the glass like I honestly thought it was like roots covered in algae but nope it was a corn <laughs> so this is what it looks like right now it's super super mangled because it was growing underneath pond but you can see that it's variegated <laughs> which is good so I put this on this list because I truly believe that the fry deck which is the variegated Michalitsiana is easier to grow than the actual green Michalitsiana I just I just really do I've, I've grown two Michalitsianas both of them were such little bitches they just would not hold on to leaves the way that the fry deck did I was it's it was it didn't make any sense to me but this plant is actually much easier than its green counterpart but I really think that this is one of my more rewarding allocations to grow not only because it's beautiful but because like it's very constant growing and it definitely grows faster than almost all of my alocasias. This might be my fastest growing, maybe not quite as fast as the other alocasia I'm about to mention. So this one currently grows inside my grow tent in pretty high light. I mean, the lights aren't that strong, but I've got it pretty close to the light. I'm trying to get the leaves to face the same way. <laughs> it's not really working right now. Every leaf wants to face a different light, but it grows really well in pond. So myself, Charmaine, Jing, and Erin, we all grow our fried eggs in pond. Erin's is probably the biggest. Hers is freaking massive. I think, I think, I'm gonna verify this, but I think Amanda also grows hers in pond. I could be wrong, but I assume it does. And hers is absolutely a behemoth. It's so big. I will see if I can find a footage or a screenshot of a video she sent me. I would estimate that 
her leaf is like from the tip of this leaf like down to here here <laughs> I could be wrong but it looked really really massive in the photo or the video that she sent me she's got it growing out in her living room of course the plants just love her the plants really do love her but anyway that's the fried egg I think it's quite easy for an alocasia if you don't want to grow it out in regular room conditions I think um, you know some sort of greenhouse environment would be good like a tent or an exo or like a greenhouse cabinet i know there are people who do it successfully i think you probably would need to acclimate it down in humidity if you can um or or do it cold turkey but expect it to get quite ugly for a little bit i can't speak to the growth rate in like cooler uh drier conditions it probably would grow slower but i would say that alocasias are quite heavy feeders in my experience i find that they really respond well to feed so I think while they're growing like I would really try to make sure I have feed in every single watering with my allocations so hopefully the next time you see this plant it's gonna be more leaves bigger and oh one thing I was gonna say this is not to do with its easiness or whatever but when I was growing this plant under stronger lights 20 watt lights it had that very classic fried egg white variegation look but when I switched the lights out for Barinas, which were 10 watts, all the variegations started to get more green. So you can see this one has got this like kind of almost minty like kind of pattern to it. This one is certainly like quite green. This one has a little bit near to the veins. This one is quite yellow. This one's one of my favorite leaves actually. But under the 20 watt lights, this variegation would have been like white. I kind of like this. I think this is kind of cool because I don't see a lot of fried eggs that have this like minty yellowy variegation. And also the prices of this plant has really, really come down quite a bit. So I would say if you can get one for a good price, a little baby one, you can grow out from a little baby corn seedling sprout. I would do it. I would really, really do it. I wanna take a quick break because I wanna stop the recording and make sure that my audio was working this whole time because that would be the worst ever. I just realized that I forgot an anthurium. What is wrong with me? What, I wrote a list and everything. <laughs> So how about we do the last alocasias? We'll jump back to Anthurium. I feel like anyone who watches this channel is gonna know which alocasia I'm about to say next. This is my alocasia scalprum. So obviously I have to talk about the scalprum. This is, I don't even think it's really an alocasia because it really doesn't act like one. First of all, it loves to hold on to leaves, which we know alocasias don't like to do. Even when I compare it to like the really thick leathery ones, like let's say like the green dragon, silver dragon, black velvet, like this one is just so much hardier in my opinion. You do not need to grow this in a greenhouse. I have this growing right here on the shelf. It used to grow in this exo here, but right now it's got low humidity. It's actively pushing a leaf. It's just trucking along always. It's constantly trucking along. I got it about a year and a half ago. When I first got it, it was like fresh from the nursery. It was in soil. I moved it, I think, to, I might have moved it to pond and then to soil or straight to my own soil. I don't really remember if it was that middle pond step, but for a really long time, it wouldn't grow. And it wasn't until I inoculated it with great white did it like just shoot up and start growing like crazy. Not only was it growing a lot quicker, it was sizing up as well. So before great white, the leaves are about this size, maybe a little bit smaller. And then after great white, we were getting leaves like this size. And this leaf has been with me for quite some time. I wanna say like good, I don't know, six months or so. And it's showing no signs of wanting to leave this earth. Other than the fried egg, depends. I feel like they're neck and neck for like my fastest growing alocasias. And this one is really, really like pot bound in soil. It, def it definitely needs to be sized up um, because if I don't water it every like four or five days, it really, really is just dusty dry. So I, I really felt like this is an, was an underrated plant um, because locally to me, they were very, very available in garden centers and stuff. And then it just didn't seem like anybody cared. It didn't seem like anybody wanted them. They, nobody was like flipping them. Nobody was posting about them in like Facebook groups. I didn't see it often on Instagram. And whenever I posted it on Instagram, it didn't really get a lot of like excitement, I wanna say. But every time I talk about it on YouTube, people in the States are like saying that they've been looking for one, they're not available to them, and they really want one, or it's a wish list plant. So I really, really think 
that by next year or by spring, it will be available in garden centers in the States. That's my prediction. How would I know that? I don't. <laughs> That's just my <laughs> uneducated prediction. But like the fact that they're in like Home Depot here, like I, it's got to make its way to your garden centers in the States. And when you do see one, I highly recommend you grab one. They're not going to be expensive. They're like tea seed and they're very, very mass produced plants. So when you see them, please do yourself a favor and get one because they are so easy. So what this plant gets from me is it's in soil, it's got great white, it's fertilized with every watering, it's under, did I say grow lights already? And there's no, no like nothing to boost the humidity on it. So it's getting like ambient humidity. This one is my easiest alocasia because it doesn't grow these like crazy long petioles. It stays quite compact. Like if you can see, like it's not like reaching everywhere. I, I've never seen a very leggy, reachy alocasia scalprum. If you're not into alocasias because they're like spider mite magnets or they're, you know, difficult to grow and they're kind of finicky and they throw a fit whenever you like repot or whatever. If you stay away from alocasias for that reason, this is the one that could maybe win you over. So back to the anthurium that I forgot to talk about. Obviously, <laughs> I had to talk about my dark phoenix. So I've had this plant for maybe about a year and a half. I imported it from Indonesia around May, June of 2021. I got it as like a very small seedling size and it suffered a lot that summer from heat wave, but it really took off and just started to grow like crazy when I moved it to pond. And coincidentally, at the same time when I moved it to pond is when I first started to use great white. So this was like one of the first plants I ever inoculated with great white. But it sized up from like this size, but the newest hardened leaf is this size. And it just recently put out a leaf. It looks like it's gonna be a really cute one, but you see that there's two little spots of variegation on it. I'm not 100% sure that the one on the mid rib is variegation, but the one right, eh. but the one right here, where my middle finger is, I'm quite certain is variegation, which is fun. I don't think it's gonna stick around. It's such a little splotch and it's on like the edge of the leaf, but just kind of fun, thought I'd show you. Currently it grows inside my grow tent because it just means too much to me. I, I, I don't think I could sacrifice the growth rate for anything because I truly believe it will grow quite a bit slower if it was growing out here, but I know that it can be done. Charmaine grows it in like her anthurium shelf or like is it even just anthuriums anymore or is this a mixture? But it was an anthurium shelf where she's growing all her anthuriums out in the open because Amanda does it. Hers is acclimated now to the to the room rather than the greenhouse. She recently moved it from soil into pond and it really embraced the pond. And I can guarantee you it's gonna just take off now. So it for sure can be grown out in like room conditions. I personally don't. But maybe when it's bigger, I might. Just right now, I really, really baby this plant because it's like my favorite little baby. So what I wanna say about this plant is, is friggin' great. I don't know what the lineage is. It's thought to be a pure pappy from Indonesia, but nobody really knows. But it certainly acts like it's a hybrid. It's very, very resilient and it's very easy going for an anthurium. Doesn't necessarily need high humidity, but I think it does better in higher humidity. Don't let it completely get bone dry. I will say that because when I did that once, I think, I think I might've done this once. It gave me an underdeveloped leaf and I think I got some of this from that little dry spell that I had. Since then, I've been keeping a close eye on it. I'm gonna water it after this video because it's like approaching, it's like 90% dry right now. It definitely increased the water uptake because this leaf is developing. So I'll say if you're gonna get a dark phoenix from Indonesia, straight from Indonesia, either find a reputable seller or be able to see the exact plant that you're gonna get because I've definitely seen sellers passing plants off as dark phoenix that aren't actually dark phoenix. I don't know what they are, but I think they're definitely capitalizing on like the the popularity of this plant. So I would for sure get a second opinion if you're not certain that it's a dark phoenix or maybe if the price is too good to be true. I can say without a doubt, this is the one plant in my collection that absolutely adores pond. Like pond just makes it grow so fast. So there's a reason why I love this plant so much. 
It's just one of those plants where it feels like the love is truly reciprocated. This next one has a bit of a reputation. Certainly before I got this plant, I had heard horror stories about it being really, really difficult. So I wasn't really holding my breath on this plant. I got it and I was like, okay, I'll probably have to baby it for a really long time and it might not grow that well for me, but it really proved me wrong because it's been just an easy going plant. And that is my philodendron patriciae. I had been after this plant for so long <laughs> before I got it and it was so, so expensive at the time. I think when I was trying to hunt down this plant, it was I was actively searching for it. It was probably around the $800 mark. Uh, I, I've definitely seen ones go for like the $1,000 mark. And then when I got it, it was, it was dropping, but it hadn't dropped quite to the level it is now. So right now it is a lot more accessible. I would say you could probably easily get one for um, $50, $75, like not a humongous plant, but like you, you could get a specimen for around that price for sure. I got this about a year and a half ago, again, around summer of 2021. It was a rooted mid cut um, from Charmaine. That leaf was gone. So since then it had grown one leaf that's not with us anymore. So one, two, three, four, five, six, Six, but every leaf has sized up and it doesn't crisp up with lower humidity. So for the majority of its time with me, it had lived in my tent and it, it just loved it in there, but it started to get a little bit big and I wanted to make some room for other plants that I needed to be in there. So I was testing it out in this exo here. So like it was probably a humidity drop about 30% or so. And it was definitely cooler in here as well. And it just, did not mind, didn't change a bit. Like it just kept on going. It didn't show any crisping. It didn't show anything really. It was just like, all right, this is my new home now. Sounds good to me. And it's currently putting out a leaf that looks like it's gonna be a pretty good size. And that would be the, the leaf that would have fully like developed and formed in that new enclosure. This is one of those plants that was on my wish list because it's beautiful. I love long leaves. I love this like kind of ripply pleated look of the leaf and like when they get mature oh my god they're so stunning with those like really really dark leathery textured leaves but those that pleating is just so beautiful i couldn't believe that it's maturing with me and second of all i really didn't think that it would require so little of me the only thing I will say about this plant is that it's quite thirsty, so the substrate does dry out pretty quickly compared to a lot of my other philodendrons. But if I keep it watered, it really doesn't need much from me and it just like keeps on going and it keeps getting better and better. I didn't even put it on a pole and it kind of takes highlight pretty well. It got a little bit close to the light here at the top, so it is lightening a tiny bit, but really nothing like too drastic. I really don't know what the deal was with like all the horror stories from before and why they were known to be so difficult, but it really is not. I truly think that it's worth a shot if you appreciate this leaf or if you like the Esmeralda Dense. This one actually based on like stories I've heard from Charmaine and Jing who have owned the Esmeralda Dense, I have never owned it. I feel like this is actually an easier plant and it's a really nice plant to have hanging in an enclosure or hanging like in your room because it it really has that really like nice drapey look. I'm gonna try to speed this up because my camera keeps dying and it's, what is it? It's like seven o'clock and I need to fix dinner. Oh, it's 7.14, okay, let's let's keep this going. I think I was done talking about the Patricia anyways. I'm pretty sure a lot of you would have guessed that I would put this on the list. This is my Philodendron Florida Beauty. I'm not even really sure how to show this to you. So these are the top two leaves, but it's really hard to show you the rest of the plant. Maybe like that. This plant is like the MVP of my philodendron collection. It started the year off extremely sad. It was like maybe like three or four leaves, but it was kind of like growing juvenile, growing really wonky. It was not on a pole. It was kind of like this, like this. And every leaf just kind of kept looking sadder and sadder. And then it kind of gave me this little thing. I was kind of emotionally over this plant. I needed a plant to put on a pole in a video that I was doing with Charmaine. It was a repot video. I think it was on her channel, but I can't remember. It was either my channel or her channel. I brought this plant because I was like, it obviously needs a pole. <laughs> Let's give him what he wants. And the rest is history. That's really all it wanted. It, it's been in soil this whole time. It had been living in my tent even before when it was really sad. It was the pole plus great white that made this like shoot to the heavens and become this like majestic beast. I cannot believe how mature it's gotten just in the span of like six months. Like this leaf, 
and this leaf are my like Florida Beauty dreams come true. It is really, really big now and it's gonna be outgrowing the EXO soon. So this no longer lives in my tent. It now lives in this EXO here because it doesn't fit into my tent anymore. It's getting too tall. So it kept getting burned by the grow lights. And since getting into this EXO, it hasn't really skipped a beat. I also repotted it into a bigger pot in no drainage and still in soil. And I can already see lots of visible roots along the side. It's definitely not thrown a fit. If anything, it might have produced a little bit more EFN out in this EXO versus the tent. But other than that, it's not crisping. It hasn't dropped a single leaf. It's still producing aerial roots. It matured so well it kept the variegation going i mean not this leaf but it does like it does kind of alternate every now and then it'll throw a pretty green leaf but it'll go right back to this i really don't want to chop it but i think within the next six months i'm gonna have to give it a little bit of a chop i feel like these are still a little bit pricey and they're not like super stable for our variegation so it is a little bit of gamble. I personally wouldn't buy like a single leaf cutting without a variegated leaf already growing out because I've taken cuttings of this plant that was very, very highly variegated and the stem was very highly variegated. It's got nice striping and it just fully reverted, never to be seen again. Like the variegation was gone. I personally wouldn't risk it on a, um, on a cutting that hadn't grown new foliage yet unless it was a top cutting because they are still a little bit expensive i think they're they're not what they used to be in like last year maybe two years ago the prices are nothing like that anymore but it is not cheap still i would rather go for a tiny baby plant because look how much it was able to mature in within six to nine months it went from like this size to this size with very very little effort i wouldn't say it's the thirstiest philodendron in my collection, but it is like drying out quite regularly. So I feel like watering and keeping the mold mole keeping the pole uh hydrated is probably the biggest challenge of this plant, but otherwise it is just such an easygoing plant. And I would say probably the same goes for like every Podatum variety. Like I assume glad hands, Florida Ghost, Florida Green, Polypodioides. I'm not sure about that one because it is so spindly. I feel like it would require higher humidity in order to like unfurl, but I think it probably would be very similar. Yeah, if anyone grows a polypodioides, let me know if it's as easy or like on the same level as like a Florida Beauty because that plant is still high on my wish list. And then of course we have the Gloriosum. Here's the big boy top cutting that I chopped up in my video a few weeks ago. I can't see. Oh yeah, it did root. It's hard to see from the front because there's a lot of algae, but there are roots here. I don't know if you can see some roots here. Nice pink root here. It had a bit of trouble unfurling because it just didn't have as much root mass to kind of support the cell division and whatever. So yeah, it's gonna take a little while for the green to kind of come through, but it looked okay. This one developed pretty good seeing as it got like 90% of its roots like removed. So this one lives inside my grow tent. I'll try to keep it in my grow tent for as long as possible. It's just, I don't know how much longer I can grow this in my grow tent. I have the bottom of the plant right here. This is the bottom right there. It has activated two growth points since being put there. And other than like a small amount of EFN production, it hasn't thrown a fit either. It hasn't really yellowed anything. The yellow that's on that plant was already there from before from a lot of um, bleaching and it just being really low down on the plant. I think a lot of people know that Gloriosum is quite an easygoing plant. And I wanted to highlight this because in comparison to a lot of the popular velvet heart leaf fillet engines, I really think that the Gloriosum is just a winner in my book because, okay, let's compare it to like, Melanochrysum. I'm so over Melanochrysum. It is, to me, a, quite a difficult fillet engine to grow and especially to grow nicely and also to get it to size up. I find that really difficult. Um, glorious, I don't find as easy as Gloriosum. Although I feel like I'm just not that talented with climbers. I think that I'm probably the anomaly with Glorious. What else are, oh, Varicosum. Ugh, like I, I, first of all, I've kind of, I've kind of decided I don't really like how varicosum look for the most part. Since I was able to feel it in person, I really don't like that texture. It's a lot thinner, a little bit more papery and just less luscious than like something like this. So I quickly got over varicosum, not very really into it, even though I really love the fuzzy petioles. So of all these like really beautiful velvety heart leaves, I really feel like gloriosum is one of the most reliable, the most um, kind of, how do I describe it? I feel like the word will come to me. 
Mm. I just feel like if there was one that you had to choose or if there's one that I had to choose, this would have to be it. And this was the plant. This was a plant that I made it my mission to try to size up this year. After Great White, things really started to look up. Things really started to size up. So this one's not even the biggest leaf that's ever grown for me. I feel like this one is the biggest, which is not like humongous as far as Gloriosum goes, but it is pretty big. If you compare it to my quite large head, my head is quite large. If I were to put my head next to Charmaine's, hers would probably look like a walnut. Even in the grow tent, this is producing EFN. And that's really like my biggest fear with growing a Gloriosum outside of the grow tent is like the slowing down of the growth rate and the production of EFN, which might burn through the leaves a little bit. But even in there, it does produce EFN, especially on the petioles. They're quite sticky. I think maybe next year I might try to grow this outside of the grow tent, depending on if it outgrows the space or not. But once it outgrows the space, I'm not going to try to keep containing it there, I don't think. I think I will try to get a little bit braver next year and grow this outside of the greenhouse and see how it does. The bottom cutting back here is definitely the guinea pig for the time being. If you've watched this channel even a little bit, you'll know how much I love the Gloriosum. It was so worth the time and effort to grow this large and it didn't even take that much effort. So this last one is the only monster on this list. It's the only monster that I feel like I've been able to grow well, all monsters I've ever grown have not really been my friend. I've failed many times and I've kind of struggled to size them up and mature them a lot. But this one, the Monstera Escaletto, was a definitely a different story. I honestly didn't expect to love this plant so much. I've always been interested in it. I always thought it was beautiful, but it was really, it's, it's so hard to see it because it's all holes. It's all blending into the background. I truly didn't think I was gonna be able to get large foliage out of it. And it's not even nearly as big as it can be, but I grew this from a, like a node, a single node with roots, but no leaves about a year and a couple months ago. I haven't repotted since, I've only given it a pole, and every single leaf has sized up. So, and an original leaf is actually still on the plant. So that's this one, and then this one, and then this one, then, would have been this one, this one, ow. And finally, this one. Can we just look at those holes? They're so beautiful tiny amount of leaf tissue that's holding this together is just so fascinating to me. And it's on a lazy pole. You can see all the roots kind of filling up here. I actually have a look behind this plant. I just I just assumed that the, there were lots of roots in it, but there are lots of roots in it. Look at that. My heart was always like with Deliciosa and the reason why I love this plant so much is because it has been so quick of a grower, so easy of a grower, it just sizes up so well, it grows so compact. I don't think a plant could have done anything more for me. Like it was, it just seemed like it was so ready to accept anything that was given to it. And I think these are quite available now. Like I would be surprised if you were to pay for like a cutting for more than like 20 to $40, like a rootless cutting obviously, but like if you were to pay for an established plant, I would not pay more than like 60 to $80 for one, like not a mature one, but like a pretty juvenile one. But just know that like once it's established with the roots and everything, and if it's on a pole, it really will just take off for you. This can be a pro or a con, but it can get light bleached fairly easily. You can see some light bleaching on this leaf here, especially like right here. So if you're looking for like a low light plant, this is definitely one of them. So I'm using the patriciae to hang above this plant to make sure that it kind of shades the plant a little bit more. I had to mention this plant because it was another like you know, triumphant moment for me in 2022. I was just growing this as a propagation and I didn't really expect it to be one of the, like the kind of focal plants in my collection. And I will say with very little to no effort from my end, <laughs> this one grows inside this exo. I think it does better here than it did in my tent because I think the tent was just a little bit too intense, a little bit too, the light was too much. It grew, it definitely grew, but I think it's, it's a little bit happier in here. I think this plant is good for the ego because when a plant matures and like, you know, sizing up and everything, it makes you feel really good inside. And just knowing that, you know, you can go from this to this in a year, that's just, it's just amazing. Nature is so cool. Ow, oh my God. Ugh. 
All right, guys, that is everything for me today. I hope you enjoyed this list of easygoing plants. Obviously, I don't expect that everyone's gonna have exactly the same experience. Certainly, there are plants that people grow really well that I highly struggle with. But if you're kind of on the fence on any of these plants because you might have heard some horror stories, hopefully this will give you a different perspective and um, hopefully it will be helpful in like letting you know what has worked well um, especially for my plants. If you have any questions on the care of these plants that I didn't cover, please feel free to leave it in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to give it a like and I will see you in the next one. Mwah.